Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. We're proud to welcome you to the Exceptional Advisor podcast series brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. This series aims to help you to better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. My guest today is Larry Kotlikoff, a professor of economics at Boston University and president of Economic Security Planning. And he joins me to discuss some of the more shocking topics from his just published book, Money Magic, An Economist's Secrets to More Money, Less Risk, and a Better Life. One spoiler, conventional financial advice is terribly risky. So welcome to the podcast, Larry. Thanks so much for having me, Bob. It's great to be back with you. It's a pleasure to have you. Now, for the benefit of our viewers who may not be familiar with you and your work, do you mind giving us a brief overview? Sure. I'm a professor of economics at Boston University. I have been working on personal financial economics as part of a long list of other things I study, probably since grad school, really. Uh, as part of my thesis, I worked on these topics. I developed a financial planning software tool in the early 90s called Maxify.com, which helped me develop the materials for the book and just also understanding what other economists have been writing about personal finance for decades. So um, your your new book just hit the bookshelves here in January, Money Magic, An Economist's Secrets to More Money, Less Risk, and a Better Life. The audience for our podcast are uh, largely financial advisors. And one of the things that you talk about in the book, Larry, is why conventional financial advice is terribly risky. Tell us more about that. Okay. (laughs) Well, so economics says that you want to look at your resources. That's to say your net wealth and your human wealth, your future labor earnings power. Net wealth is like your retirement accounts and your checking account, all these financial assets. Your social security is also... Those future benefits are an important financial asset for most Americans are probably the first or second largest financial asset. So, and then we've got negative financial assets or negative obligations, resources like alimony payments, like, you know, if we absolutely want to send our kid to Oberlin College at 75K a year, like I did, that's a real obligation. There's mortgage payments that you have to make uh, other housing expenses. So we got the positive resources, the negative resources, the net resources, And then we've got taxes, which are dependent on how you do your spending through time. Because if you don't spend much and you accumulate a lot, you're going to pay more taxes. So taxes depend on spending path and that spending path that you can do depends on the taxes. So there's an interaction. So anyway, economics says this is a complicated problem, but we have to start with the resources and figure out for people what they can spend on a sustainable basis so they can have the same living standard per household member. That's the key thing to, to economics, the living standard. What do you get to spend? It's not about just accumulating a huge amount of money for uh, somebody to invest and earn fees on, on your behalf. And you end up you know, dying rich, but dying, okay? Never having spent your money. Uh, or, but it's really about what you get to enjoy over your life, but also if you wanna leave money for your kids, thinking carefully about how much that, that you'll leave them. So. Um, so it's about spending. It's about having a smooth living standard uh, when you retire, having the same living standard when you're as before retirement. Maybe with some some differences there, you may want to cut down on spending because of a uh, you know physical ability to consume and also the likelihood that you won't make it. So economics says you should plan for your maximum age of life, but allow for the fact that you may not make it. You want to smooth your living standard like a squirrel does in accumulating acorns for the winter. You wanna raise your living standards safely by optimizing over social security and uh, minimizing your lifetime taxes. You want to, want to figure out in terms of your living standard, price your lifestyle decisions in terms of your living standard, like retiring early, what does it mean to my living standard or divorcing, what will that mean? And you also wanna think about your investment risk in terms of your living standard ups and downs, the trajectory of your living standard that might arise. None of this is connected at all to what personal uh, conventional financial planning does. They have a completely different methodology. Let me pause here and let you respond. Well, I, I do. I want you to sort of compare uh, what conventional advice is doing that's risky and how it differs from what you've described as traditional economics point of view of what consumption, smoothing, okay. life cycle, savings, and investing, I guess, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah. Well, here's my understanding. And, and you know, many of your listeners may 
think that I've got it wrong, in which case I apologize to them. You know, this is my, my understanding is if, if you're the financial advisor, Bob, I come to your office uh, or come to your uh, software. Uh, if you put me in front of, uh, you know, cause you're using software that maybe your uh, larger entity has uh, forced you to use. The first thing you're gonna ask me is, well, how much are you saving? And how much you have in, in wealth? How much do you want to spend in retirement? What's your target? How are you investing? They'll ask those four questions. And then they'll say, well, let's take your saving and assume you continue saving that amount through retirement. Let's accumulate it up with your wealth. And we'll take draws in your, in your portfolio that you've told us about. And we'll, we'll accumulate that up to retirement. And then in retirement, we're going to decumulate your spending that you told us about. And then we're gonna see how many of these trajectories that we run, these Monte Carlo simulations, end up with you um, succeeding, not running out of money, and end up with you failing, which is you run out of money. Now, running out of money in this context means starving to death, just to be clear. It means have, if you have nothing, you have nothing to eat. So economics would never, ever, ever contemplate a plan for somebody that entails them possibly starving to death, even with the smallest possible probability. So there's four mistakes here. One is uh, that you're saving. This is all contingent on your saving. Uh, we're basically assuming that you're saving the right amount rather than saying, gee, uh, maybe that's maybe you're saving too little. Uh, and by the way, the target you just gave us, which is a billion dollars a month, that's completely unaffordable. Uh, and uh, that's crazy. It's not connected at all to your resources or your, you know, your net resources. So the spending is wrong, the saving is wrong. And then the, there's two other assumptions underlying this, is that you never adjust your saving no matter what before, before retirement age, and you never adjust your spending in retirement, which both of which are antithetical to what economics says. Economics says that if you're in a risky situation, if you're investing at risk or there's other risks, like you lose your job, you're gonna adjust your saving and your spending. You're gonna dissave when you when you know, when you send the kids to college, you're, you've been saving up for them. So you're gonna reduce your saving because you need to use that uh, accumulated wealth to put them into college. So you don't have to lower your spending. You wanna try and maintain your those acorns. And same thing with spending. When you're in retirement, if you're let's say living in large part off of your assets, and you've had a big hit on the stock market, maybe you've had have 30% of your wealth in the stock market, it goes down 53% like it did in the Great Recession, you're gonna reduce your spending. That's what economics says to do. You adjust your spending in light of your resources. It's not timing them, you know, and then, well, I mean, there you may change your allocation as well if things are riskier. Uh, that's a, a separate conversation about what kind of portfolio to hold. But the basic idea of smoothing your living standard and raising it and pricing things based on it and then adjusting so that uh, and understanding your living standard risk, your uh, the risk to your living standard, your investment living standard risk, none of that is in conventional finance. So, so what I see the conventional finance doing is saying, well, let's come up with a plan so that you we don't have to visit any pain on you. We don't have to tell you to save more, we don't have to tell you to spend less. We don't have to, all we'll do is tell you how to invest in a more aggressive manner. So you have a higher probability of making your target and you will have a higher probability if you put more, let's say in stocks and bonds, but you also have a bit higher probability of losing your shirt, okay? Think about investing just in inflation index bonds, 30 year tips that are yielding right now around negative 11 basis points. So if I've got a million dollars, that's all I've got. I'm 60, let's say 5 million, I'm 62. I just retired, nothing else, no social security, no 401k, that's it, 5 million bucks. I put it all on tips. I've got a trajectory uh, that's perfectly safe in terms of what's coming in apart from tax issues because they tax nominal, not, not real income and inflation can affect the nominal return. So it can affect the, the taxation on tips, but let's, let's set that aside. I've got the stream of income. And now if I take it and I say, look, I'm gonna put half of that money, that I'm gonna get rid of the tips. I'm gonna invest uh, half of my money, 2.5 million in stocks and 2.5 million in bonds. Well, the upside over time is gonna be much better than losing 11 basis points for sure. But the downside is gonna be much worse. And so you need to see that. 
that spread to your living standard. And you never want to get into a position where you could, could end up consuming nothing, where you could be on the street. So that's not what I see uh, conventional planning doing. I see them saying, focusing basically, hey, you're only getting 11 basis points. We can do better for you. Let's invest this way. Look how good the upside is. You're, you're probably a failure. Just went from uh, this number to a much lower number. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> that to me is a bait and switch. Yeah. It's, a, it's a sales, it's selling products. So financial advisors, I don't think should be in the business of being conflicted where they're both giving advice and selling products. I think there's a conflict of interest there that is inappropriate, to tell you the truth. And, uh, you know, uh, we have a software that uh, is underlying a lot of the results in, the, you know, what I'm saying in the book, although the book is not like, hey, do this in the software, do this. It's not a pitch to sell the software because I don't expect people to, to use the software. A lot of people, most people don't want to run software. They just want to know what the answer is. So I would try to provide that. But in selling our software and in selling the, the book, there's nothing there about buying any financial products. There's no conflict of interest. So what advice would you have for the conventional financial advisor, given that maybe they're not trained as a classic economist and that they have these conflicts? What, what's the solution for them? Well, you know, the book is really laying out the economics approach to financial planning. There's um, obviously much more technical things they could look at going back 100 years to the work of Irving Fisher. You know, there's an entire field in economics called finance where 11 people have gotten the Nobel Prize for their work in finance. About half of those has really been connected to personal finance. Uh, if you look at Bob Merton, who uh, strongly endorsed uh, the book, Money Magic, he's got this book called Continuous Time Finance. It's got very high-powered math, but you know, if, if you kind of skim through it, you would learn a lot about where you know <laughs> the basics of what economics has to do. One of the interesting things it says is to try and hold a, for reasonable preferences, to hold pretty much the same portfolio of safe versus risky assets through time. But this is a kind of looking at your total resources, not just your financial assets. So if you've got a social security, which is safe or labor income, which is safe, kind of independent of the stock market, then you can take more risk. And, but also you can put more into to stocks versus, because you already have a lot of bonds, but they're not called bonds. They're called labor income or they're called social security or they're called uh, pensions in a low inflation environment or an environment where the pension is inflation indexed. So that's that's kind of an important lesson that we want to be uh, diversified between risky and safe assets in a comfortable ratio, but maintain that ratio through time in the context of our broader set of, of resources. So that's just like one of the many lessons that this work, but I also discuss all this in the book. And then, you know, if you wanted to go further and be a financial advisor that does economics-based financial planning with your clients, it's a simple thing to go buy our software at maxify.com, M-A-X-I-F-I.com. We've been in business since 1993, does all the taxes for 51 states, including DC, Irma provisions, Roth conversions, can help you with reverse mortgage analysis, whatever you want, downsizing, upsizing your home, understanding what that means, your living standard, looking at your living standard risk, the upsides and downsides from investing at risk. And then uh, I could also tell you about a method of investing called upside investing, which I discuss in the in the book in which the software incorporates. That's a safe way to invest in the stock market without any, any risk whatsoever to your basic living standard. Hmm. But I don't know if that's something you want me to get into now. Or... Well, I, I do want to talk about that. Um, but, but let me first talk about something that you mentioned a second ago. I should preface my remarks by saying, you know, years ago, you were instrumental in helping create the retirement management advisor designation, which the Institute now owns, purchased it from the Retirement Income Industry Association. And, uh, and one of the uh, key components of the uh, RMA is this notion of Social Security. You talk about it in the book being one of your biggest retirement decisions. Talk a little bit about the role that Social Security plays and, the, and, and what the advisor needs to know about Social Security as it pertains to their clients. Sure. So we don't think about Social Security as a financial asset because it, when we, uh, we don't have the kind of levers uh, with Social Security that we do with you know, our brokerage account where we can 
move things around between stocks and bonds and REITs and other, and Bitcoin, whatever. But Social Security here, we've been contributing 12.4% of our pay, we and our employer, but our employer is not doing us any favors. So it's really coming out of our pocket. 12.4% of our pay since age 16. So that's like our, you know, a huge amount of saving that we put into the system. So it's no wonder that the benefits that we're going to get out are a big deal. You know, even if the system isn't actually fair, uh, we're treating our cohort as well as it treated prior cohorts. It's a major Megillah here, as we say in Yiddish. So you can impact that asset, not by choosing, you know, portfolio allocations, but by deciding which benefits to take and when to take them. So first of all, the important thing is to know that there are 13 benefits that Social Security offers. We're mostly familiar with the retirement benefit. And even there, most of us don't realize or don't seem to realize that if we wait till 70, the benefit adjusted for inflation will start out at 76% higher value, again, adjusted for inflation than if you started at 62. That's an enormous increase And so by waiting for eight years to collect, you're giving up eight years of benefits, low benefits. You're in effect paying something that given what you give up to buy this higher annuity. So you have the opportunity to buy an inflation indexed annuity from Social Security at this, these incredibly favorable, favorable terms, enormously favorable terms. And then you're protecting yourself against living to a hundred because as you keep living, this money keeps coming in. You're also getting putting more of your resources into an inflation protected asset. So for both reasons, you want to be doing that almost all the time. Most people, like 85%, should be waiting till 70 to take the retirement benefit. Only about 6% are doing that. So we have enormous mistakes being made, enormous amounts of money being left on the table on the sidewalk when it comes to just taking the retirement benefit. But then people don't know about things like spouse benefits that a low earning spouse could could collect if the other spouse was a higher earner, divorce spouse benefit if you're married for 10 years or more, widow's benefits, uh, divorce widow benefits if you don't remarry before age 60, then there's disabled benefits for children. There's just say there's benefits for young children. If you've taken your retirement benefit, uh, they and your kid is under uh, 19, still in school, high school, they can collect. And if you've got a spouse who's watching either a uh, young child under 16 or a disabled child, uh, they can get what's called spousal and care child benefits. Now, there's also parent benefits. If you've got a parent, like I had my mom, uh, she passed away in 98. I was uh, taking her as a dependent on my tax return. My brother and sister were helping out, but I was the main you know, supporter. If I had passed away, she could have collected 75% of my full retirement benefit. Even though I wasn't collecting, hadn't collected, uh, that's that would have been a huge benefit to her and to my brother and sister. They had no knowledge. My brother is the provost at Cornell. He's a pretty smart dude. My twin brother, okay? Uh, so he's five minutes older than me. So he's smarter than me because he's older and wiser. But he would have no reason to know about this. My sister, who's run major companies, would know, have no knowledge about this. And even I didn't know about it until I really went to town to look it up and understand it. But that's one of the 13 benefits. So we, we need to know our benefits. We also have to know that if we don't apply for them, we will not get them. Social Security will not call us on the phone. We could be 80 years old, not having collected our Social Security benefit, which uh, there's no gain to waiting after 70. I've had people 75 years old call me up and say, you know, I'm still working. Can I collect my social security? I said, yeah, you could have started back and, you know, you had no reason not to wait, start collecting them at 70. At most, they're going to give you six months retroactive benefits. You've just given up three, uh, four and a half years of, of maybe it's 40,000 a year or 30,000. You may, you may have just lost by negligence $130,000. That's losing something perfectly safely. Okay, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about how to raise people's living standards perfectly safely before you start thinking about investing in risky ways. Let's make sure you pick up, pick all the low hanging fruit. But the biggest low hanging fruit is not to lose money uh, by ignorance or mistake. Uh, And that's why the book has has value, I believe. Yeah. So in the book, you also talk about 
sort of claiming strategies relative to your other assets like an IRA and that you recommend that a person taps their IRA first and their social security second. Talk more about that. Sure. Yeah. The, so if you have money, I'll, I'll give you a, a real example. I was syndicated columnist for a couple of years and I had an editor who was uh, going back about 10 years ago, who uh, out of the blue calls up and said, he's had it. He's going to retire at 65. He's going to take his uh, social security money. He tells me on the phone and wait till 70, well, uh, 70 and a half to start taking his, uh, his retirement money when the required minimum distributions kick in. Kick in. Uh, so I said, um, well, let me run you through the software. Let me think about this with you. I could, you know, after a few, uh, you know, a few minutes of running him and give, he gave me the numbers of his situation. It was clear he was like leave, leaving about $75,000 on the table by doing it that way versus taking his retirement account money first and his Social Security later at 70. So he t- tells me, um, but gee, I've got the money in the stock market. It's going to make a killing. I said, well, if you risk adjust it, the return is uh, dramatically lower. You have to risk adjust it to do an apples to apples comparison. Social Security is perfectly safe. The stock market is perfectly risky. It's got a 20% standard deviation every year. So it does pay a fantastic return on average, but you can't count on it. So we have to risk adjust it. Now, right now, if we risk adjust the stock market, it, it turns out we're, the stock market is yielding a, a negative 11 basis points on a risk adjusted basis. So if I compare taking uh, Social Security early, to, which has got this enormous return from waiting, to taking uh, my IRA, which might be invested in stocks, which is yielding risk adjusted negative 11 basis points, it's a no brainer. I want to take the IRA money and let the Social Security grow because it's going to get this enormous return. So that's that's an example of why you want to, well, that is the story for why you want to take your retirement account money before you take your social security in almost every case. Yeah. Now, if you had pancreatic cancer, if you're single, that, that might be different. You take your social security right away. But if you're if you have pancreatic cancer and you're 68 and your wife hasn't worked or your husband hasn't worked their whole entire life, doesn't have much of an earnings record, hasn't worked much. You want to wait till 70, even if you don't collect a a penny, because you're going to be raising your your widow or widower's uh, survivor benefit by 16%. Uh, Their benefit, the widow and widower benefits, and as well as the divorcee widow and widower benefits are based on your actual receipt of benefit, the benefit you actually receive. All the other dependent benefits are based on your full retirement benefit, regardless of what what you actually end up collecting. So... uh, this isn't very important to know. And that's that's where the, um, you know, uh, and then you also wanna be very careful about the timing of taking retirement benefits versus widow benefits. You don't wanna be taking them at the same time. It's the, the book talks about that. You can screw yourself out of a couple hundred thousand dollars if you do this the wrong way. Just by checking a box on a form, the, or having, letting Social Security check the box for you. Some official doesn't know what they're doing or out of malice or out of ignorance does this, uh, you could be, you know, turn out to lose $200,000. I've seen cases like this. The inspector general uh, accused its own uh, agency, Social Security, of screwing 13,000 widows and widowers out of $130 million by doing exactly this, checking both boxes when they shouldn't have, and they have yet to correct this. Uh, the inspector general, general came out with this report two years ago. They said, fix it, Social Security. Social Security has refused to do it. Mm. Uh, Larry, in the, in the book, you, you, all, you have a, a number of items that are maybe contrary to conventional wisdom, one of which is to cash out your IRA to pay off your mortgage. Yeah, on a risk-adjusted basis, your IRA is yielding negative, well, it's, Let's talk about it in nominal terms because inflation index, it's negative 11 basis points. But right now, the, uh, the 30-year treasuries are yielding around two, uh, 200 basis points, about two percentage points. Mortgages today are yielding four percentage points. So if I just took out a mortgage, to, you know, let's say this month at 4%, at 4% and I had $200,000 Let's say I had um, money in a in a checking account or in a Roth account. 
that I could right away take without any tax penalty uh, and use it to pay off the mortgage while I'd go from earning 2% on an inflation, even if that money was in the stock market, even if I had, I was in a broker's account, not a checking account, but in the stock market, on a risk adjusted basis, I'm earning 2% for sure. On the, the mortgage, I'm earning for sure negative 4%. There's a two percentage point differential there. And if we're talking about a big mortgage over 30 years, that adds up. So that could be $75,000 in present value. And I give an example in the book. Now, if I take money out of a taxable IRA, let's say I'm 62, there's no penalty at this point of taking money out, but I do have to pay taxes on it. And if I use that money, the money after the taxes are paid to pay off my mortgage, Again, uh, I show in the book that this can be a big saver because the return, the safe return to investing is so low and the safe return to paying off your mortgage is so high that uh, you win the differential. And yes, you have to pay taxes, uh, but you might be in a low tax bracket right now because you're or relatively low because you uh, were furloughed. Uh, maybe you're in between jobs during COVID. We have a lot of people that are, you know, have retired early. This might actually be the ideal time in terms of tax brackets, but also the deferral from taxes is low because interest rates are low. The, the gain from deferral. So there's two gains from, from the traditional IRA. One is uh, being able to take out the money at a lower tax bracket. And the other is uh, inside buildup, the deferral. And both of these things are, are low uh, and then the other thing is that the mortgage doesn't, in addition to having to pay pay this high rate for sure, uh, there's no tax break from the mortgage because the standard deduction is so high these days. Nobody's taking the mortgage deduction. But also I want to point out that the mortgage would be the, the, the last debt you'd probably want to pay off. The first debt would be your credit card bill. The second debt would be your student loans. The third debt would be the next highest, you know, interest rate debt might be a car loan or something or some loan to a, from a cousin. And then the then you pay off the mortgage. So you want to be paying off the highest interest debts first. So the, the gain would be that much bigger if you could pay off a student loan, for example, that's, you know, charging you six, seven percent. Or your parents, it might be charging your parents seven percent. Uh, another item that in the book that caught my um, eye was this notion of uh, when you're working, buying stock in your employer's competitors. Yeah, so your human capital is your main resource. If you, let's say you lose your job because your industry, your company is uh, beat out by your competitors. Well, you might not just lose your labor income from the job, but you might also have been given the stock in which you're invested. So you lose that as well. The value of that goes down to nothing. So you lose on both fronts. So you're kind of compounding your, your risk. If you buy your competitor's stock, then when your company does poorly, you have your job does poorly. <laughs> you may get fired or get no, no raises, but you gain uh, from that outcome by having your competitor's stock go up in value. Indeed, I talk in the book about if you could, you'd want to sell your, your company's stock short because uh, you'd want to bet against your company, not because you dislike your boss or you're not loyal to your company. Otherwise, uh, you're not handing over trade secrets. It's just that you want to hedge your own risk. Uh, many of us have most of our risk associated with our human capital. Uh, others of us have a pretty, you know, state, you know, we, if we're working, jobs that um, where there's a, a good market for our skills, uh, whether we work here or there, there's not a lot of human capital risk associated with this particular company, uh, if I can e easily move. Mm. But uh, that's not always the case. Maybe kind of firm specific human capital is what we call it in economics. Uh, also from the book, Larry, and this is somewhat topical given the number of seemingly gray divorces that are on the rise. You, you talk about how to divorce without a divorce war, but how does one go about doing that? So I, uh, <laughs> it's actually easier than it, than it sounds. And I, I thought about that. I kind of realized this when I went through my own divorce. And since I had our software 
I was able to use that to think through what's involved here. And what's involved here is really not, you don't want to get into a fight over all the details, like who's going to get this car or that car or the puppy or this favorite painting. Leave that kind of skirmishing for later. The big question is, what's the relative living standard you and your uh, 2BX uh, what's the ratio of those two living standards you want to uh, try and achieve? Now, it could be that you're married for now 40 years and you love each other. You just can't st stand living with each other. And you think that uh, an equal living standard is the right ratio. There's a right, right solution. So therefore, the ratio would be one to one. But it could be that maybe you're 50 and one spouse is working a whole lot more than the other and is it likely that one's maybe not working at all or much at all. The other spouse is a type A personality is going to work till 75. Well, then maybe the ratio, proper ratio should be 1.25 to one. Give that spouse who's working harder, 25% uh, higher living standard. Anyways, what I'm saying is uh, figure out this ratio. And then once you figure that out, everything else drops out. It's magical, and you suddenly become on the same side of this uh, dispute because you're both interested in raising and doing whatever can be done inside this divorce agreement to lower your your joint lifetime taxes, to raise your, make sure each of you is maximizing your uh, divorcee uh, social security benefits. If you can get your living standard as high as possible. That means both of you will benefit because the ratio is always going to be 1.5 to 1, 1.25 to 1. So that means that if one person's living standard is higher, the other person's living standard is higher. So having that more abstract discussion, what do we think, you know, given all the grievances, you, you mistreated me, I mistreated you. Okay, let's put that all on the table and say, what do you think is fair? Maybe we can right away agree to what you think is fair. And I think we can agree on what's fair. Now it's just a matter of uh, divvying up the resources so that we can see that we both end up with a living standard that has that ratio 1.5, 1.25 to one. Mm. That's the way an economist would divorce. And it can keep the kids from having to choose sides. It can keep the family together. It can keep everybody being friends. I mean, you know, after all, we all get married deeply in love, right? None of us at the altar is talking about getting divorced but half of us do get divorced. We need to get married understanding we are likely as not to get divorced. We need to get married expecting to get divorced because we're risk averse. We have to look at the downside. That's what economists are good for, being morose, okay? Being dismal, dismal people. <laughs> it's the dismal them. science, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the dismal science for a reason. And you have to get married expecting to get divorced. That's why a prenup, only 10% of people that get married get a prenup, but a prenup can actually help people stay married because it can help deal with um, concerns that people would have about getting divorced. If I give up my career to help you uh, go to law school and I had a promising career, I want to make sure that I'm not going to get a crappy alimony settlement uh, as a result, especially if we live in Texas. So if we have a prenup that makes this clear, you know, if we marry, if we stay married beyond this number of years or, you know, if or that I should get some return on, on your human capital that you've accumulated, even if we get divorced after eight years, after you get out of law school, I should have a claim on that. Now I can safely live in Texas, as opposed to saying, gee, if I live in Texas and we get divorced, I'm really going to get screwed because their divorce laws are so, not laws, but their kind of divorce um, guidelines are so uh, miserly with respect to the uh, the lower in, in earning spouse uh, that um, it would behoove me to live in Massachusetts instead. Yeah. Well, I promised that we, we would return to a subject that you brought up earlier in our conversation about uh, investing and, and upside and uh, yeah. talk more about that. Well, this is something I'm super excited about because I got, I have to give Sabi Bodhi as a emeritus professor of finance at, at Boston University, a lot of credit for this because he has, written several books with co-author, well, by himself and with co-author about worry-free investing. So the idea here is how can you do what most middle-class and even upper-income people 
and certainly poor people want to do, which is to have, I think everybody wants to do this, even if you're super wealthy, you want to have a, a sustainable living standard that you know you're not going to go under, uh, you're not going to experience a, a, any kind of a decline in your living standard of any significance, but you still want to have some money in the stock market. How can you possibly be in the stock market without putting your basic living standard at risk? It, it's very simple. And I lay this out in the, in the book, in the chapter at the end about how to invest like an economist. It's called upside investing. And what you do is you say to yourself, okay, here's how much stocks I've got. Here's how much money I've got in the stock market now. Here's how much I want to add in the stock market. And I'm going to spend today and up to the point where I start withdrawing from the stock market, let's say maybe that's 60. Maybe my plan is I'm going to got some money in the stock market. I'm going to add some over the next 20 years, um, 40. At 60, I'm going to start withdrawing. By 75, I'll be completely out. So I'll take 115th of, and when I'm 60 out, 114th when I'm 61, et cetera. So what I do then is I spend, assuming right now when I'm 40, assuming that every penny in the stock market that's there now and every penny that I add and I'm going to add is lost entirely. And then I'm and I uh, invest whatever's not in the market in inflation index bonds. Uh, or, or something equivalently safe. So now I'm facing no investment risk and I can figure out my living standard floor. That's my floor and I don't spend a penny above it regardless of what's going on with my stocks. I don't look at them. Now age 60 comes along. I take a look at the, I open my portfolio. Maybe I've got my money in a diversified S&P fund regardless of how maybe I'm uh, managing it. But anyway, Whatever it is at age 60, I take a, a 15th out of, out of it, and I put it into tips. But this lets me, allows me to raise my floor to my living standard because with that extra safe money, I can have a higher living standard for the rest of my days, but perfectly safe. So what I'm doing is having, if you can see this, a living standard floor here that then ratchets up, ratchets up. And every year that I take something positive out of the stock market, I'm ratcheting up this floor so I never have any downside living standard risk. It's always upside. And depending on how much, how the stock market does, that determines how much my, my living standard ratchets up. And so we run Monte Carlo simulations of the upside in the, in the software. But conceptually, again, this, the book is not conditional on the software. One's not, it doesn't depend on the other. I'm just trying to say that I've learned about this by programming it, looking at it, looking at the results and seeing that the whole thing works. Mm -hmm. It's just like going to the casino and leaving your wallet in the hotel room. That's your living standard floor. Your credit cards are in your wallet. You're not going to be, a, you're not going to be at the casino at the roulette wool, wheel, having made some winnings and then take out your credit card and start ordering things on Amazon predicated on the notion that you're going to leave the casino with a big wad of money. You don't leave, you don't, this idea is you don't spend anything until you leave the casino with something positive. You don't, cons it's casino investing, if you like. Yeah. It's called upside investing. It produces a floor to the living standard. Conventional planning doesn't have this in their bailiwick. They've been talking about trying to floor your income by bucketing, by having a bucketing strategy. I'm going to put so much into short term securities like checking account, so much into intermediate bonds under the assumption that they're safe for the medium term and that the stock market is safe for the long term. Well, the book debunks the idea that stocks are safe for the long term. Stocks are not safe for the long term. And this whole idea of flooring your income, A, flooring your income is not flooring your living standard, and B, you can't floor your income using this bucketing strategy. It's not at all guaranteed. Uh, you can floor your fantasy, maybe. You have this fantasy that you're flooring something, but you're not actually achieving anything yeah. for real. So I have a lot of concerns with conventional planning. I don't have any any complaint, real concerns with financial planners because I know so many, some of whom use a software, software, some of whom don't. But I have yet to come upon a financial planner. I've met thousands who I didn't like as a person, who I didn't think was honest, who wasn't trying to do their best. But when they go to conventional financial planning school, they get their CFP certified financial planning degrees. They don't 
get to hear even 10 minutes of the economics approach to financial planning. It's not taught. And we don't teach 10 minutes of the conventional planning in any of the top business schools, in any of the courses in finance taught by economists. Yeah. So there's a complete disconnect. And that's part of the reason I wrote this book to get across to the public that economics has an entirely different way to think about your finances. And it's, you know, without question, going to keep you safer, going to raise your living standard, less risk and a better life. Yeah. Larry, we covered a lot of ground. One question, if I could sum up part of what you've just said is this notion that many financial advisors are putting at risk their clients' living standards by investing their portfolios the way they do. Is that a fair characterization? I think that I don't want to, since I don't know what, you know, I haven't done a survey of what they've done. And what I think they're, what they're, they're stuck with bad education because all these programs are like 20 certificate degrees. None of them really present systematically the economics approach to financial planning. Maybe the RMA is doing that at this point. I may be wrong on saying that none. Uh, but, and a lot of, of these financial planners are forced to use software that their larger entity, maybe it's Fidelity, maybe it's TIA, uh, maybe, uh, you know, is forcing them to use, they're not allowed to use some alternative software. So, but then what they do have is common sense. And they do know that what the tools are saying and the approach is doing doesn't necessarily jive with their common sense. They see a household that doesn't save enough and they say, you know, we could put you all in stock and it would still not fix things, okay? Even under the best of circumstances, you're just overspending. Okay, that country club, uh, 20,000 a year, you know, resign. So I think financial planners are applying common sense in a difficult context. What I want to do is kind of alert them to the idea that the notion that there is an alternative formulation here, an alternative way to think, even if whether what, regardless of what software you use, just understanding the concept of, finan of economics based financial planning, what we economists have developed over a century of work that includes 11 Nobel prizes and the you know were awarded in finance people need to understand this it's just like I'm the medical doctor at talking to people that have been trained in chiropractic they have a certain set of tools but we have some penicillin so I want I want to tell them about the penicillin and I know they've been trying to apply their own penicillin uh, to the extent they can. Yeah. All right. So we covered a lot of ground. Anything we missed or anything that bears reemphasizing? No, I think we're good. I, I really appreciate being on, the, on, your, on this podcast and uh, talking with you. Thank you for listening to the Exceptional Advisor podcast brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcast to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. For additional resources, updates on events, and exclusive membership deals, visit www.investmentsandwealth.org.